Very, very powerful fish, these. Oh, clutch is just smooth as silk, that is. What we're gonna do once I've got this fella in, is have a look at the rigs that I'm choosing on this, on this water. We know the smaller lakes are definitely more riggy than the bigger lakes. And uh, you need to get it bang on right to be falling these crafty carp. And it's not just this venue, it's everywhere that's got plenty of pressure. The rigs have got to be bang on. So when we get this fella in, we're gonna have a look at my rigs for uh, finicky small water fish. You can see he's absolutely nailed there. Still got power in him. I think he's gonna be ready now. Yes. Come on, baby, you are mine. Get in the net. Come on. Oh. <sighs> top, top result. <laughs> Heart in the mouth stuff that was. But uh, well pleased to get this one, well pleased. Right, this little fella has just got a little bit of a scrape on there. So we're gonna, just gonna dry that off. Like so, clean towel or a bit of kitchen towel, and then the body ointment from the carp care kit just goes onto there, and that's just gonna stop that from going septic. It's gonna help it heal and make sure next time someone catches him, he's absolutely perfect. Don't know how that's happened. Looks like a bit of a scrape. It might be through a snag if they've been spawning or something like that. It's not an angler wound at all. Let's hoist him up and show you. And give that a chance to soak in on the other side. And there he is. 24 and a half pounds. Very, very welcome in the hottest part of the day. Hopefully that hot sun is uh, moving the fish around the lake now, warming the water up, and hopefully we'll get a few more bites during the session. But for now, let's get this fella back and have a look at those all important rigs. Mr. Hamidi, who's fishing just a little bit further down the lake there on the point, has been digging me out this entire session. He's been saying my rods don't work at under 140 yards. Well, contrary to popular opinion, I do a lot of short range fishing. The Syndicate Lake I'm fishing back in England at the moment is very precise fishing at sort of 40 to 70 yards. Um, and uh, uh, this is no exception. I'm fishing one rod probably 20 yards out, but only five yards off the bank. Another rod slightly further away from the bank and the other two are spread at different ranges. So I've changed the rigs around to suit this kind of situation. Genetries has got a hard bottom to it, so the lead's not plugging in and that gives me the opportunity to use an inline lead on the shocker system. I've basically got one of our safe zone leaders with two four mil safe zone rubber beads on the end of it a quick link on the end of that rather than a swivel and then that just pulls up nicely inside the lead. I've taken the insert out so that it slides easily backwards and forwards through there and it just looks so neat and tidy on the end with a little quick link on the end of my hook link. I'm a perfectionist when it comes to neatness on rigs and I think it stops you getting tangles and then two thirds of the way down the leader on the bit of tungsten there I've got what a four mil rubber bead just to stop that lead so if I, if I slide that down bang onto that. Let's do that again for you so you can see it. Bang. So the fish moves off, it can't use the weight of the lead to get rid of the hook, it's shaking its head and as it's moving, whack, the lead hits the backstop as well. And uh, I don't think it's any coincidence that I'm getting loads of really, really fast takes on here where I've startled the fish. And then moving on to the hooking arrangement, I've got one of our curved B hooks straight point but a curved shank which holds in really well even when it's barbless. I wouldn't use a hook with a straight shank and a straight point in barbless but a curved shank and a straight point works perfectly well. These are extremely sharp and they catch hold really quickly. If I just pull that across my hand there that's gone straight into my hand. No need for shrink tube with this pattern as well even if you're using a braided hook link. So if you're not a fan of shrink tube or you haven't got a kettle with you then uh, that's the pattern to go for. And the same thing with the, the hybrid soft that I'm using. It's the gravel coated one. On the large lake jolly, I was fishing the dark green one to match in with the silt on the bottom. It's hard on the bottom here, very muddy. I've looked in the margins to see what color it is. And it's almost the same color as that hook link. So that's why I've swapped over to it. Rig camouflage, in my opinion, is very, very important. And then going back onto the hook, I've got a little bit stripped back with one of our stripper tools and I've tied the hook on with my favorite knot, which is like a whipping knot. You tie a big loop underneath the hook, turn around the hook, once going up the shank, and then carry on four or five times going down the shank, 
pull the little tag end tight to tighten the knot down. And it's something I got taught when I was a kid and I've never stopped using it since because it's never let me down. I've got a little tiny micro rig ring up the shank of the hook there. That's holding the hair in place. And what it's doing is it's making the point of the hook heavy. You can see on my hand there, it's catching hold. Every time I pull on that hook link, the hook's just flipping over and catching hold. One of my favorite dumbbell hook baits, just tipped off with a bit of plastic corn. And I'm fishing that with a PVA stick. And I'm just fishing singles at the moment. I'd be more than happy to fish this setup over bait as well. But it seems to be early in the year, the fish are not feeding that hard and the single hook bait approach appears to be working. And you'll see there as well on the hook link, just down from the hook there, I've got a tiny bit of putty. Both these hook links sink like a stone with no putty on them, but I'm adding the extra to it just to help it pin down and help pull that hook into the fish's bottom lip once it's sucked the rig in. So that's the first one, shocker style. And uh, me being me, because uh, I can fish to the far margin, I am fishing to the far margin as well. I've got two on this side and two on that side. That's my far margin setup. Looking at the leg clip system first of all, it's going to cast a lot further than an inline because the nose of the lead's not being pulled off course like it is with an inline. If it does bury because it's travelling so fast at distance, the part of the lead can bury in and it's not going to affect how the hook link's working at all. I've got it on a lead clip there. Again, on a safe zone leader, I'd be happy to use the clay coloured rig tubing if I didn't have any safe zone leaders with me. And on the end of that, I've got a quick link, exactly the same as the inline system, so I can swap between the two if I want to. A normal lead clip on the back there with the rubber and everything, but that's not going to eject the lead. As the fish picks up the bait and moves off with it, that's going to slide away from the fish, just like the shocker system with the inline, and that's what's been mucking them up. They really can't deal with this system because the lead's sliding away from them the whole time. And then hook link wise, again, hybrid soft in the gravel brown colour. But if I just drop this hook down onto the palm of my hand, you can see how aggressively this one's going to turn. As soon as I put anything onto that hook, as soon as I tighten that hook link, it's going straight away. I tied the hook on with the normal whipping knot that I always use, and then I've put a little tiny bit of shrink tube to help the hook flip over even more aggressively. But most importantly, I've cut the tag end off of the knot and I've tied it on using a half blood knot, just a three or four turn half blood knot onto the bend of the hook. And that's what's making that hook flip over so quickly. So if you've got fish that are very, very cute and you know it's going in and out of their mouth really quickly, you're getting funny takes, swap over to something like this and I think you'll get more bites. And on the end there, I've got the new Grange as a hook bait, and then I've got a little tiny floating pellet on there, sorry, floating bit of corn on there that's just gonna sit that up, just like that off the bottom. So it's not slow sinking, it'll still sink very quickly, and it's gonna catch hold in that fish's bottom lip perfectly every single time. So they're my rigs for pressured lakes with a hard gravel bottom. Don't be afraid to shorten the hook link down. That's the biggest feedback we get from when we're doing exhibitions. People have seen the underwater films, they've shortened the hook link and they've got a lot more bite. So if you're using eight inches on a hard gravel bottom, drop it down to four and you'll probably catch more. Look at that. What a carp. 33 pounds of fighting muscle. Oh, what a fish. What a fight, and what a way to end my rigs on small waters, pucker. If you haven't yet joined the plastic revolution, I totally understand. It took for me to go fishing with Gaz Fairham and get beaten up by him. He was getting bite after bite and I was catching nothing. I couldn't get my head around not having a real bit of food on the end, but believe me, it works. And Enterprise Tackle have to take the credit for bringing this onto the market. And now everybody that I know fishes with it almost every time they go fishing. So let's have a look at my favorites. Um, you can't beat this, two bits of plastic corn, just on a short hair there, that's a little size eight wide gape, number six shot, hybrid soft hook link, and it'll just sit up just like that. When I'm spotting and I'm fishing with hemp and corn and a bit of chopped boily, that is my number one approach, especially if there's a little bit of weed on the bottom. And then if you want to use a bigger hook, that's a couple of grains of maize. Um, because it's bigger, that floats just a little bit better than the corn, so you can get away with a bigger hook. A size six wide gape like that would sink two bits of corn, which if you want to fish it critically balanced is great, but if you want to fish it popped up, you need to move over to a couple of bits of maize. So they're my pop-up rigs. Another great way to take advantage of the plastic corn is to tip off a standard bottom bait, a bit of real food as it were, with a bit of plastic, and the combinations here are literally endless. So I'll talk you through the first one. That fellow at the front there is a 15 mil dumbbell hook bait with a bit of glow in the dark plastic. 
So when it gets dark, you'll, that will glow a beautiful sort of bright green colour. You can charge it up with a torch if you want to. I never bother. And it's weird. Some places you find that that will get you your first bite at night. I don't know why. And then you can swap the other rods to it, obviously, and get loads more bites. But that really does work on certain waters. I know people that have used that for zig rig fishing on mini zigs on shallow lakes, perhaps three, four foot deep. They're fishing a three foot zig with two grains of that. No other bait in the swim and it's roaring off when nothing else is happening. So don't ignore the glow in the dark stuff. And then a lovely bit of pink on the end there. There's loads of different colors you can get. Again, some places just respond to certain colors. And what this is doing in every situation, you imagine the fish are coming into the swim and you've got loads of boilies out there and they're sifting off different ones. And there's a little tiny pinhead of color in the middle of the baited spot. More often than not, that's going to attract them. So the fish come in, oh, what's that? They pick that one up and that's attached to the hook. You know, and that's why colour is so important. You can use different colours on different rods. One may stand out from the others, and then you'll get all your, put all your rods onto that one, and obviously you get loads more bites. All this stuff takes flavour as well, so you can buy them flavoured. The pineapple butyric one in yellow is probably my favourite out of the whole range, but you can buy several different other flavours, including tutti frutti. Um, I can put my own flavours in as well. If I just pour a little tiny bit of flavour into either a little jar or a bag and just put some unflavoured stuff in there and just just move it around inside the bag and just leave it for a few days and that concentrated flavour will penetrate into the corn and in the end every time you pull it out you can smell it after I've used it a little while I'll put it back in the bag reflavour it and just use a new bit now this one if you're fishing abroad and you've got any problem with crayfish or poisson char that is a great little way to fish it so I've meshed up my boilie there uh, with a bit of nylon mesh and my hair stopper, if you like, is that bit of very brightly coloured maize. That's a great colour as well, that lime green. I've got in there um, a little extender stop that's pulled up inside that bit of maize. So there's no way a poisson char or crayfish can get that off. That will stay on there until you get a bite. Now the nice thing about bottom bait fishing with these on the end is the buoyancy of this almost counteracts the weight of the hook. So it's going to go in their mouth just that little bit easier than a standard bottom bait. Another good little tip. Right, tiger nuts. This is the tiger nut, believe it or not, that I've just, I've just shaved all the skin off the tiger nut to expose the white flesh, just to give it a little bit more attraction. And then on the top of it, I've put a bit of white corn. White seems to be a brilliant color as well. Again, it's taking the weight of the hook away. And you imagine there's a bed of tigers out there and hemp and stuff, and there's one little bit of white or two little bits of white if you're fishing two rods on the spot. As the fish come in, oh, what's that? They go down for it whack you've got them so another great way tipping off any bottom bait with a bit of corn you have to test them in the edge obviously to make sure that they're not popping up too much but that's a great way to take advantage of it now the next one is the all singing all dancing KD rig that we've been raving about recently we've got a curve shank hook on there and then on the first one we've got two grains of corn which are obviously buoyant and on the hair we've got a number four shot squeezed on and the way that's going to sit on the bottom is literally just like that so the shot is just counteracting the buoyancy of the baits and effectively making the bait weightless so it goes into the into the mouth very very easily but it doesn't stop the hook from turning and catching hold you'll see on all my other rigs if I've got some weight to the hook bait the hair will actually be coming off the hook down here which basically you're making the point of the hook heavy because this is weightless you don't want it attached to that end of the hook. You want it attached to almost the eye of the hook. So that KD rig will help that to happen. It actually makes the, the eye of the hook light, which in turn makes the point of the hook heavy. And another great fake bait from Enterprise is the plastic tigers. Again, slightly buoyant, fishing that over a few tigers and a bit of hemp, or literally just on its own. Now Ian Russell rates this as one of my, if I really need to get a bite, this is what I put on baits. So well worth trying that. They do peanuts as well for fishing over the top of peanuts or any particle. Great little rig. Combine the KD rig with a bit of buoyant Enterprise floating corn or a tiger and you're going to get loads of bites on that. So we continue. This is little bits of trickery that uh, Ali's tied up for me. Um, I'll put all three of those on there. They're all tied on, on the Supernatural. I've been using the coated material, the hybrid soft for the other rigs, but this is when it's really getting tough and you think the fish are preoccupied on tiny, tiny food items. So there, we've got a couple of grains of sinking hemp and then a little tiny bit of micro corn, which is floating. So when that sits on the bottom, 
it sits with the point facing down. So if you're fishing over hemp and you're not, you're not getting any bites on boilies because they're switched onto the hemp, you can try a little bit of trickery like that and that'll probably get you extra bites. And then the, the famous Magaliner that Mr. Rob Malian has made famous and loads of people have caught lots of fish on. That's a little tiny maggot there. He's slightly buoyant. The other two, which are brand new, they're sinkers. I mean, that looks so much like a maggot, it's ridiculous. These fish are feeding on sight. There's a big bag of maggots out there that's burst open. There's maggots everywhere, and that's flying up into their mouth. There's no idea that there's any hook there or anything from the fish's point of view, because it's completely covered up by the artificial baits. And you'll notice there on these hook links, we've got another new bit of trickery on there. That's a little hook link weight. Looks like a float stop, but it's actually tungsten mixed with rubber. So that's heavy and that's going to sink that hook link straight down to the bottom immediately. So a great little addition to any rig and they're going to be out by the time this DVD hits your tackle shops. And then finally, if you're fishing over a bag of pellets, here's another little bit of trickery from Ali here. We've got a floating pellet and then a bit of corn that doubles as a hair stop. So no hair stop on there. Again, that makes it very difficult for any kind of nuisance fish to get it off. And that's just going to sit like that, fished with a bag of pellets, funnel web bag, about golf ball size, especially on those waters where pellets are used a lot, that's going to get you a lot of bites. So that's just a brief introduction into the baits that Enterprise do. There are loads of others that you can choose from, flavour them, chop them up, use different colours, they'll definitely get you more bites. And there we have it, 28 pounds, 12 ounces of muscle pack mirror. I've got them beautiful scales down by the wrist of the tail. Another one falls to the power of the funnel web PVA systems. So let's give you a few top tips on using the funnel web. Dun, dun, dun. I present to you the Crusher, the Corder Crusher. By the time this DVD hits the shelves, this will be readily available, but I bet you're wondering what the hell it does. Now, it's got a few uses and a lot of varied uses, so let's take you through them. Right, it's got two sections, as you can see. This is the, the push-in section. This is the bit that you put your bait in. As you can see, I've already had a little play with some boily crumb just to get used to it. Right, let's put some uh, four mil halibuts into here. Don't overdo it, just, just enough to play with. But what this is going to be great for, or those of you who might go fishing just with a bag of pellets, you get down the lake, you want to use a stick mix or a different bag mix just to, to give your bait a bit more attraction. In we go, push this down, crush it down. Now listen to this, the crusher commences. Lovely, lovely, grating noise. Now check that out, absolute crushage of pellet. That looks deadly. I'm going to put that in there. So four mil, four mil pellets turned into sort of like pellet crumb, all different sizes, all different breakdowns, absolutely superb. Put, do a few more of them just to uh, get the bait tub going. A couple of handfuls basically that is. Again, as you can see, I'm putting it in the inner bit, not the, not the top side. Down, crush and grind. Awesome bit of kit, much, much better than the vegetable chopper, much, much more refined, breaks things down really quickly, no messing, no blades getting caught up. It is an absolutely devastating product, this is. As you can tell, I'm really excited. So there's our little halibuts ground down. Right, the next little baby that I'm going to put in them are these wonderful, wonderful tin tigers by Bait Tech. Now, not only have they got diff you know the bigger ones in there, but they've also got these absolutely awesome tiger morsels as me and my mate Gaz Ferrum say that is a bite so I'm going to put these again in the little crusher lends itself perfectly to sort of small baits in they go and what this will do not only will it crush the tigers it will also release some of the natural sugars that are inside them giving you that sort of deadly deadly bag mix I'm also going to just put a bit of that tiger juice over the top now tigers alone straight out of a tin or straight out of your bait bucket won't be useful for going in PVA. However, by dusting them down and then pellets in a minute, they're gonna be ideal. So in it goes. Listen to that, so easy to use. Chop nuts, absolutely devastating bait. You can even use a couple of these as your hook baits, you know, like a chop bit of nut, especially on short day sessions. So in they go. So we've got a little tiger and pellet bag mix here. 
that's, that's enough to soak in that juice off the tigers so it doesn't melt your PVA. Awesome. So let me just show you the sort of rig I'll use that on. PVA bag, let's tie one off. PVA is a bit, right, here we go. Okie dokie. Usual score, this is the big funnel web size. Again, it comes complete with a plunger like all the systems that we do, making it the all round product. So, here we go. Little bag, again, we're not trying to feed them, just trying to catch them. So, a 50p size bag is ample. Just got that in there, just twisting it down, keeping it nice and tight. By making the PVA bag tight, what you're doing is when it melts, it'll explode, giving you like a fan of bait rather than a small cluster. A lot more attractive to fish coming over the top of it. Pull that down nice and tight. Again, all the instructions to get your PVA bags tight are on the front of the, uh, the tube, so any sort of newcomers to the sport can check that out. Also the Corda website, cover a lot of PVA stuff on there, www.corda.co.uk. So that's done, lovely little bag. And uh, I've got a KD rig here with uh, an Enterprise fake tiger nut on it. And uh, just gonna hook that on. That is a devastating little method. Perfect, a few chopped tigers, a few ground down halibuts, and without the crusher, that wouldn't have been possible. The last little one I want to show you is, uh, again, I've put one of those pre-drilled uh, halibuts on there. That's the 12mm um, pre-drilled halibut. Lovely size, beautiful bait. Again, like I say, very, very attractive to carp. And uh, you can do a little mixture here. I use a few 4mm ones. Nothing wrong with actually putting a few of the uh, bigger halibuts in as well, just to uh, keep the carp guessing. Small little handful. In they go. That's slightly larger than obviously the ones we ground down. Some of that bag mix. Again, twist, turn, twist the top of the bag again. Pull that nice and tight. There we go again. Same again, 50p bag size. Cut it with me, uh, razor blades. And again, you see, I've just tipped that off with one of them Enterprise um, corn hair stops. So rather than using a standard sort of hair stop or extender stop or a bit of fake plastic, that lends itself to the job perfectly. In we go. Again, another devastating method. That's gonna catch you loads and loads of fish. And just to show you what the big crusher does, this has been primarily made for sort of 18 mil boilies and the bigger ones. I've got some of my cell baits in an air dry bag here. These are 14s. Take that loose tiger out of it. 14 millis cell baits. They're lovely, these cell baits. When, you, when you've got the, um, the sugars arriving, they just see how they've gone slightly white there. That's the natural sugars coming out of the bait. They're ideal in that state. In it goes, put it down. And again, you can just hear that crumbling that bait. Look couple of turns and an absolute awesome handful of chop boilies. So whether you're fishing over weed or margin fishing or just putting them into your spod mix, you know how popular that is in Dan's various spod mixes. Chop baits play a massive part in it. Well, as you can see, the Corda Crusher, an expertly designed product that is definitely, definitely going to put a lot more carp on the bank for you. Welcome to my crib, the Tracker Ultralight. I'd like to call it the Tracker Versatogs. The reason is, when I was looking for a bivvy, I wanted something that had done everything, and that was go up quick, also be suitable for long sessions. So let me just talk you through the product and how it works. Firstly, if you're fishing short day sessions, it's ideal. You can have your guest chair set up and your sort of bag next to it. If it starts trickling down with rain, all you have to do is take this little baby out of the bag, fan the product out, fan the bivvy out, um, almost like a set of bat wings really. That makes sure there's nothing tangled and then comes in the magic part, which is the sort of unique locking system that this product has. Two poles go into it and then you just open it up with the little S clip going over, locking the bivvy completely open. All you have to do then is peg the two back points in, 
giving you an absolutely rigid setup. You don't need these front poles when you're just fishing a day session. All you've got to do then is just come around the front and just put a couple of pegs in at the front on the wings, the side panels, and again on the other side. That gives you a perfect little day shelter and also an overnight shelter. Here for a longer session on Gigantica, so I'm going the full hog, setting it up exactly how I'd like to, to be comfy for a week's session. Again, lay a ground sheet out, similar to the Armo, lay it down flat on the floor. That gives you sort of your area, your perimeter where it's all gonna happen. For, again, locking system, fan it out, put the poles in, open the bivvy up, go to the back two pegging points, push them in. That sort of will hold the bivvy up while you do the rest of the work. Next thing you have to do is come around and just um, zip on the front. It comes on here really easy to zip on, goes on nice and quickly. And then the next step is to thread these poles in, okay? So what you've got there, you've got the framework all ready to go. The next job is to put the front pegs in, okay? And then push these poles in. So that gives you the uh, sort of tension between the side peg and the front pegs. Next job, put the pegs in in between. Again, on the other side, use all the markers on the ground sheet. That's how they've done it. They've got all these little elasticated points on the ground sheet to give you exactly the point that each peg should go in. If you follow that, you'd have a really, really rigid bivvy that is versatile and usable anywhere you go. This is the new quick lock bed chair from Tracker. For all intents and purposes, looks like one of the other bed chairs in their range. So nicely padded, a wide bed chair. And if we look at the front there, six fully adjustable legs, aluminium frame, which makes it extremely lightweight. There's a couple of unique features that turn it into a really special product. And the first of these are what gives it its name, the quick lock facility. If we look down there, that's the unique ratchet that they've put onto the bed chair. And that's operated by like a, a metal lever at the back here that I literally just pull up and that releases it up into each of its positions like that. So you can go from a bed chair to a chair and that will support your weight, no problem at all. And if that wasn't enough, we've got like an air bed inside here and they reckon 10 to 15 puffs into that turns it into an even more comfortable bed chair. So I've closed one valve, I've put a few puffs in this already. Let's put just a few more in. Okay, that'll do. You don't need to be fully inflating it, and it should be feeling sort of like a waterbed would feel. So the air is moving around inside it, and that's basically supporting your back and feeling just that little bit more comfortable. It may not be for everybody, but go to your local tackle shop, set one up, have a lay on it, and see what you think. This is a new 365 sleeping bag from Tracker, called the 365 because you can fish with it 365 days a year. And the reason for that is this inner skin system. So in the summertime, you'd literally just use the outer skin. This is fully waterproof, so you don't need a bed chair cover over the top of it to stop the water getting on it if you're sitting on it. And then in the winter time, you'd add this extra skin into it. Now, it's fully reversible, so you can fish with fleece against your skin or just with this more slippery material. I prefer this one because I can get out of it easier. And it also gives you the option to have three layers on the bottom, if you want, and one on the top, two and two, or three layers on the top and one on the bottom, depending on what's comfortable for you. Now, to attach it, if I turn this up, you've got a strap underneath, and then at either end, it just hooks over the bed chair. So it's not going anywhere when you're getting out of it. And when you have got to jump out of it because you get a bite, just see there, it's got a crash zip. So you get straight out of it and into the fish. And at the top end, if I just take you up to here, let's just zip it up all the way up to there, it's got a zip on either side, so you don't have to keep changing it round on the bed chair. And if we just go to that clip there, if I was gonna get out the other side of it, then I'll just do that up so it doesn't keep unzipping on the side you're not gonna get out of. So loads of features, perfect for the angler that's gonna fish 365 days a year. We're gonna look at a few of the chairs in the Daiwa range now. First of all, the specialist chair, aimed at the pleasure angler, whether he's float fishing or leisuring. A very comfortable chair. It's got padding at the back there for when you've got your head back. Padding all down the back of the chair and on the seat as well. A couple of armrests for extra comfort. And then on here, you can attach a little tray on the side of it for putting your bits and pieces on. It will recline at the back of the chair as well. And it's got fully adjustable legs. So a very comfortable chair, probably if you're day fishing. 
And then as a guest chair, or if you're traveling really light as a carp angler, the mission chair there weighs absolutely nothing, this one, a nice carpy green color, and it's got fully adjustable legs on it as well. Ideal for someone like Tom Dove when he's wandering around Walthamstow reservoirs. And then finally, the most comfortable chair, adjustable legs, it's a recliner chair, got loads of padding, and extremely comfortable, as you can see from Hamid. Hamid? Hamid? Right, I'm going to take a moment to talk you through the Chodrig phenomenon. Um, basically, evolved from the helicopter rig many moons ago, and uh, my good friend Frank Warwick on a lake called Reedsmere went on to develop what, is, what was known at the time as the short rig. He then took it to Oxford, passed it on to the likes of Terry Hearn and Nick Hellier, and they then evolved it and is now known as the Choddy. Right, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to tie it up and the components you need to use with it. Now, what you can do, very easily, go into any good tackle shop and get a Chodrig Safe Zone Leader. Now this has all the components that you need to use a helicopter Choddy system. On there, let me just show you, got a quick link, that comes on there, that, that allows you to attach a lead where you've cut the swivel off. So you've just got the brass loop on there, that goes on, or stainless loop in this case, straight on there. You've then got your helicopter sleeve, which goes over the top, giving it a really nice flush streamlined finish. Above that, we've got a four mil bead. Again, that's weedy green color to match the weedy green safe zone leader. And then an extra helicopter sleeve. These were made specifically for the job of using a helicopter rig. You've got a little groove in there that allows you to tie PVA string around it to keep it tight if you're gonna cast out of a PVA bag. But with a choddy, that's not necessary. Okay, let's get down to the business end. Here, I've got a size 11 ring swivel. Okay, I like the, the small little ring swivel because that allows the pop-up bait to sit nice and pretty. It's not putting too much strain on it and trying to pull it down. To that, I tie a free turn blood knot whilst using a high memory monofilament. Okay, this is called a bristle filament, 15 pound breaking strain, more than ample for any carp you're going to land. By putting a free turn blood knot in it, it's important to just ease it down really slowly. So avoid kinking it, do it nice and gently, work the knot, take your time, very important part of that. Once you've done that, you've then left with sort of three or four inches of bristle to work with to do the other end. I pass that through the front of the outturned eye of the choddy hook. Now let me talk to you about the choddy hook. We developed these specifically for the job to be used with um, stiff monofilaments or fluorocarbons. What it does, it allows the, the line to exit the, the hook at the, at the right angle. With, a, with an interned eye, it can sort of kick out too far and uh, not only close the gap, but also during a prolonged fight of a big carp, it can sort of wear down the line and sometimes break it. Now, as you can see there, that's got a beautiful angle, comes out lovely. And what we've done on, on a lot of the, the sort of popular chod rig patterns, they've got a straight point. Now, we found with a lot of the fishing we do that a straight point on a short rig can sometimes result in a lost fish. We've beaked it just like the wide gape. The wide gape has the reputation of being one of the most awesome big carp catchers in the country and very few people lose any. I know Gaz Fairham and a few of my other mates have lost probably two carp in the last four years on them. So really, really impressive hook to landing ratio. So once you've got that, the line goes through the front of the eye, down, you then make a loop at the end. This is like a spade end knot. And then whip up six times around the loop and then passing the tag end back through the loop I've made. Pull a tool, take it to my mouth, and once again, wet it and work it down really, really slowly. The last thing you want is to kink it. Now, when you're first tying this up, you might get it wrong a couple of times. So have a bit of a practice run at home until you've got it perfectly right. That'd be that. Once I've tied it down, it should be sat with a nice bulk, bit of a uh, bit of knot around the eye. Next thing, get a rig ring. I, I like to use a small rig ring because it's just got um, enough size, not a micro one, the small one, it just moves around the D lovely. Put that onto the tag end, then push the final part of the tag end back through the back of the eye, coming out the front. You'll then have, again, a bit of excess bristle poking out the front. Cut it down so you've got about a quarter of an inch showing. Now's the tricky part. Get the lighter, ensure that with your fingers, you're covering the knot and the line nearest to the eye and then just with the lighter, blob it. Slowly blob it, just to give you a little bit of, um, I don't know, like a little area at the end of the bristle that stops that from pulling back out the other end. And you'll be left with a lovely little gorgeous D like that, which allows that pop-up to move around beautifully. Okay, then same thing with the lighter, down at the knot end, 
take the lighter and again cover everything, blob it down nice and slowly and you'd be left with a couple of mil. Now what, what these blobs do, obviously at the D end it stops the tag end from pulling back through the eye. At this end, if you're in a prolonged fight and, and in the rare instant that you not might slip, that blob just gives you that extra bit of security. But in all my, li in all my times of using it, I've never ever wound a carp in and seen that not to have moved at all. The magic part is the curve in the hook link. Basically how you achieve that is by rubbing the filament once you've tied it all off, that warms it up and allows you to shape it. And what I carefully do is just slowly bend that down. That gives you that curve, really aggressive angle. What that means is wherever a fish comes from, whichever direction, that hook can spin round and catch hold. Awesome. Right. Now, a little bit about how to um, get the best from it. Now, Mr. Warwick, our Frank, used to fish it like this. Fixed. Now, if you know the depth of silt, then that's how I'd use it. Basically, you've got tension from both ends, so it causes the carp a lot of problems. Whilst the legend that is Mr. Hearn, I know, likes to use it sliding. Again, what this means, wherever you cast it, you know it's going to sit pretty because that will penetrate into the silt. That hook link will slide up and just sit nice and pretty like so. Okay, that's them bits. Let's talk to you a little bit about the right lead to use. Um, if you're fishing short range, deep silt or weed, little square pair like that, I think that's a two ounce one. I sometimes use a one and a half ounce one. Ideal lead for that. Again, if I'm fishing over a hard bottom at range, then the new distance swivel shape, absolutely perfect for the job. And then a little bit about the pop-ups as well. Very, very important with this rig to use a super buoyant pop-up. I've got a cork ball um, cell that was, uh, that was custom made for me, if you like. They're, they're ideal. They'll stay up for up to 72 hours, no problem at all. And then here, again, little cork ball one that I've rolled myself out of the Polaris mix, that will keep up that size 6 choddy forever. I've seen a few people use this with um, bottom baits, but that's a big no-no for me. With a lot of uneven bottoms, that rig could be hanging down like a monkey swinging from a tree, so don't go there. The same goes for when using it over seed baits. and um, When people are putting beds of hemp down, because it's a fashionable rig, some people just like to use it, but what you've got to remember, carp have got their snouts right in the bottom, and that pop-up is a long way away from their mouth, so not the one for fishing over seed baits. However, if you're scattering boilies or using it as a single, then the pop-up and the choddy is an absolutely devastating method. As I've already said, I've fulfilled every angler's dream by buying my own venue. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what's going on here over the next few months and what's happening for the future after that. It used to be called Domain St Christophe, it's going to be called Gigantica, basically to represent the size of the fish that are swimming around in this place. I wanted to get somewhere that I could put my own stamp on, so there's a lot to be done on the lake. Swims like this one are going to be completely redeveloped, in fact all the swims are going to be completely redeveloped to make them flat and safe. They're going to cut back into the bank so you can get your bivvy behind the gravel, so whatever way the wind's blowing, you can get out of it. Now, in the past, there's been 13 double swims, which means there's been up to 26 anglers a week, all fishing four rods, all using a boat, and to be honest, it's been absolute bedlam, and that's why in the summer months, not a lot of fish have been caught. We're cutting it down to 14 swims, single swims, and only 12 anglers. And every Saturday, when you arrive, there's gonna be a draw, and then you choose the swim at the time. So you're not gonna be able to book a swim a year in advance anymore. You have to go in the draw with everybody else, and then choose your swim depending on the conditions and where you come out in the draw. We think that's a much fairer way of doing it. We're gonna cut the rods down to three rods, and that takes it down. If you're 12, 12 sets of three rods, is 36 rods. There used to be 102 rods a week on here at times. Drop that down to 36, there's gonna be a lot more bites. And stock-wise, to be honest with you, we really don't know. The previous owner said 950, maybe 1,000 fish. I'm not so sure. I'd rate it at three to 600. The best week since, since we've had control of the lake has been 90 fish out in a week. So you've got to think a quarter of the lake's population out in one week would be very good. So that puts it, what, 360, maybe 400 fish. Maybe there's more than that. It's a big place and it's very deep as well. It's probably 18 to 23 foot deep over most of the lake. It's fairly flat as well, and we're gonna change that too if we can. 
the plan is we're going to get gravel, take it out on a barge and actually drop it at sensible ranges around the lake in front of every swim so you've got a nice gravel hump to fish to if you want to rather than just a flat abyss. The other thing we're going to change is no more remote control boats. From next year boats won't be allowed on here at all. That stops people basically coming out too far and fishing in other people's swim and that's happened a lot. We're going to stop the permanent markers as well because they're dotted all the way around the lake and it's an eyesore. So you're going to have to cast from the bank. We're going to allow people to row their own rowing boats out to bait up. But if that becomes a problem and people putting too much in, we're going to stop that as well. And this is all to get people more bites. You may think it's making it difficult for you, but if you take the boats away, take the commotion away, I'm sure the fish are going to come in closer, especially if there's features there, and then you're going to get more action. Going back to the stock, the lake record this year, the biggest fish that's known to be out this year, we know because we were here, was 72 and a half pounds. An absolutely enormous fish. You saw me lose a fish earlier on in the week here, unfortunately, which felt a massive fish. That's the kind of fishing you're doing. It's not a runs water. You're not going to be catching 30, 40, 50 fish a week. You might only get two or three bites, but one of them could be the fish of a lifetime. And that's the sort of angler we want here. People that are prepared to blank in the pursuit of massive fish. If you get it bang on right, you could have three or four 60s in a week. There's probably five or six known 60s in here, plus the 70 pounder plus some backup 50s, 40s and 30s. And there's a lot of scaly fish in here as well, which is unusual for France. They're sort of hard wick or, or horseshoe lake looking fish, popular places in England where the fish are known to have great big scales and look absolutely beautiful. They're probably 25 to 35 pounds at the moment. Imagine those sort of fish at 50 pounds. It could be absolutely awesome. We're not putting any fish in here straight away. We don't want to risk losing the existing stock. And what we're going to do over the next few years is build the stock of fish up so there's a few more fish in here and everyone's getting more bites. So a lot's going on. It's going to open up in April. It'll run right the way through until December. Everyone starts on a Saturday, finishes on a Saturday, and the bookings are going to be through a couple of agents, one for Europe and one for the UK. And those details are going to be coming after this little clip. So that's just a few of the things that we've got in store for Gigantica over the next few months. Check out the website as well, which is gigantica-carp.com. We'll be putting updates on there regularly to show you how the swims are being built and what fish are being caught. Hopefully we'll see you in next season. Thanks for watching.
What an afternoon's angling and what an end to the DVD. Two slings full and the net full as well. We're going to get these beauties out and show you what I've had. Oh, and there he is, the first of the trio. 42-2, taken on the gravel coloured soft hybrid, the curve shank barbless and a running in line. That's been the successful setup on this small tricky venue. And uh, I've still got two more to show you. Pucker, look at that, what a beast. Ooh. Right, my love, you can go back. Mwah. Thank you very much for making your acquaintance. And I'll see you when you're bigger. Off it goes. Au revoir. Let's show you number two. Oh. And this one is number two. Just an ounce shy, 35 pound, fought like an absolute beast again. Loads under the rod tip. And taken as always on the funnel web system, the boily one this time with my favorite stick mix. A little tiny dumbbell just tipped off with a bit of plastic corn, just as we've shown you. What a result, what a carp. Look at that, a proper animal. And we've got one bigger to show you as well. So let's get this fella back, give him a little kissy. Thank you, my love. Off you go, back to your watery home. Oh, Leviathan. I'm going to rest my arms for a minute so I can pick that big one up. Oh, look at this. Oh, what a way to finish the DVD. We started with a 60, we've ended with a 50, 53 pounds, 12 ounces. Oh, a stunning, stunning carp. And I'd just like to say thank you very much to all the guests that were on the DVD. Their contribution has been excellent. And I'm sure it'll put a lot of fish on the bank for you. And thanks also to the companies that are involved for showing us all their latest tackle and the tactics and the tips that go with it. So without further ado, we're going to get this fella back and I look forward to seeing you on the bank sometime. Thanks for watching. Oh. Give you a little kiss before you go, my love. Thank you for making your acquaintance. What a beast. Oh, and he's off. Pucker!